Hey YouTube, hey subscribers, thanks for tuning in. First, let me apologize for my leave of absence. I know I've been away for a while. It's never intentional. It's a combination of really bad bloggers block, over analysis, and life. So I have a ton of videos that I've actually started up and just haven't finished them. And I'm debating doing maybe a cutting room floor episode where I just take all of those partial videos, mash them up, and then just put them out there with the understanding that they are not complete. I hope you guys have all been doing well. Thank you to everyone who's been checking on me and happy 10,000 subscribers. We have actually crossed over the 10,000 mark, which is incredible and amazing to me. So in this video, we're going to talk about how life with narcissists is incredibly lonely. It's a very lonely existence. Those of you who've been following for a while know how I feel about cliches, but there's one cliche that I actually think really holds true here and really makes so much more sense when you take it in the context of being surrounded by narcissists and you often hear people say things like, I was surrounded by people, but I was completely alone or I'm completely alone in a group of my friends or I feel alone in a group of my friends or I feel alone when I'm around my family. So in other words, in the presence of all these other people, these individuals still feel alone and lonely. And so it leads you to ask the question, why? Well, if they happen to be surrounded by narcissists, it makes perfect sense. I've been catching up on season five of House of Cards, which I must admit is very hard to do. I cannot follow that show very well. It is hard. It's so quiet. It's so quiet that I put on subtitles just to make sure that I can understand what they're saying. And then the show itself is very dark. I mean, like literally dark, like like not a lot of light. And so it's dark, it's quiet, they're like whispering, and I'm always trying to figure out what's going on. So I only sorta kinda know what's going on. I know an election is going on. I know some weird stuff is going on. I know it's paralleling the current president, the current administration. I get all that, but I still don't, I still haven't quite latched on to the subplots. So yeah. But what I did latch on to was this quote by Frank Underwood, who plays the president in House of Cards. And he was talking to his speechwriter, and this was actually episode nine of season five. And he says, for there is nothing more lonely or terrifying than feeling unheard. Nothing more lonely or terrifying than feeling unheard. And I just find that to be such a true quote and such a true statement. There is nothing more lonely or terrifying than feeling unheard. That's why I focus a lot on how narcissists communicate with people or rather don't communicate with people. They tend to dominate conversations. They interrupt a lot, which I think is the rudest thing that you can do to somebody else is interrupt them. They leave no room for another person to enter the conversation and ask a question or it's not a conversation. A conversation is a tennis match. This is more like a game of solitaire with narcissists, but solitaire with an audience. They want you to watch them play solitaire and be excited about their wins and be excited about winning all the books. They, they want you to be excited about their game of solitaire. That's what life with narcissists is like. So if you're surrounded by a group of them, it's easy to feel lonely because you know that you're never actually really heard. You can tell them something very important going on in your life and they either won't remember it or they'll skate right over it and move on to the next topic. They'll skate right over it and move on usually to something about themselves. And that leaves a person feeling very lonely. It leaves people feeling like they're not seen. It's such an interesting aspect of human nature. We all have to know that we are real and that we exist. And you would think, well, that's silly. You wake up every day, you have nerves, you feel yourself, you eat, you go to sleep, you know you're real. But the weird thing about being human is that you have to have somebody else reflect your realness to you or it starts to affect your psyche. It starts to make you feel invisible. And this is why a lot of people act out and do really crazy things sometimes that make the news because probably, and it doesn't justify what they've done, but chances are their whole entire lives they haven't felt seen or heard or people don't listen to them or they disregard them. They don't take them seriously. They don't account them as real. And as a result, they do something that certifies and validates their realness to the rest of the world. And it's usually not something very good. 
I was recently listening to a sermon by T.D. Jakes, and he also said something very powerful in his sermon. He said that his mother was his first audience, and his mother taught him to value his thoughts and value his words because she listened to him when he spoke. And I thought, wow, isn't that incredible? Look what true attention, genuine attention to another person can do for a person. Truly being heard, truly being seen, it's almost like it completes the entire process of building a human, creating a human. A lot of children grow up with the experience and even for a long time, and it might still be true in certain parts of the country and the world, this philosophy of children should be seen and not heard. And parents who subscribe to that have a tendency to cut their children off. They don't let their children explain. They don't let their children tell their side of the story. They don't let their children speak. And they certainly don't listen when their children speak because they don't account what the child has to say is valuable because it's a child. So the question then becomes, at what point does that cross over? At what point does the child voice become valuable at 10, 15, 16, 18? What age then does a child's voice become valuable? It makes me think of situations where say a child gets in trouble at school and you know the parent comes to the school, they hear the teacher's side of things, lash out at the child, punish the child, and the child is trying to explain themselves and the parent might say something like, I don't want to hear it. That creates a rageful individual over time. That's why a lot of these kids have issues. And it's not to say that children are on equal footing with the parent in terms of calling the shots, directing what goes on in the household, directing what happens with the household. Obviously that can't be the case, but part of that hierarchy shouldn't be the complete discounting of the child or the complete discounting of the person. So back to the school teacher scenario, the child might actually be wrong. What they did might actually be wrong, or maybe they made a bad choice, or they were irresponsible, or disrespectful. Whatever the case may be, the child may actually have been wrong, but the child still deserves to be heard out. They still deserve to put their side on the table. And then once they put their side on the table, that's when you then say, well, do you see how that was disrespectful? Or do you see how what you did there was irresponsible? Or there's always the, the chance that if you actually just hear the child out, you'll discover that maybe the teacher was wrong. All teachers aren't perfect. Just because they have the title of teacher doesn't necessarily mean that they have great judgment. So you, you owe the child the, the possibility of being heard out so you can weigh it and see who was right, who was wrong, or how responsibility should have been divvied out. So I give that example to say that the same thing happens to adult people. And it usually starts in childhood though, but they grow up and they become people who are never allowed to get their side out. They're never heard. I actually had a boss tell me once after I had put in my resignation and they were doing an exit interview, they wanted to know, you know, well, why are you leaving? And then before I could answer, which is typical, she goes, I think I know part of what happened. She goes, I don't think you were ever truly heard. And I said, you know what? That is very true. And I wanted to say, why did it take this? Why did it take me resigning? Why did it take me leaving you guys for you to finally say, I don't think you were ever heard, which really was a confession of her saying, we didn't listen to you. We don't listen to you. Then you might as well not even be in the room. Why do you pay me? If you don't listen to me, you don't read what I write, you don't listen to me when I speak, then why am I here? Why do you pay me? You know, am I here for decoration? Because it's starting to feel like I'm just here for decoration. So all that is to say that life with narcissists can be very lonely because they ignore the sum total of you as part of a way of trying to diminish you into nothingness, which again leads to the title of this channel, which is permission to exist. We have permission to exist. We have a right to exist. But narcissists, one of their primary goals, whether they are conscious of it or not, is to erode you into nothingness, to diminish everything that you are 
until it completely disappears or vanishes. I stated on a video a while back that narcissists are basically murderers without the courage. They don't have the courage to wipe you off the face of the earth, mainly because they don't wanna tarnish their good image, their good public image. So instead, they kill you in other ways. They try to destroy you mentally. They try to destroy your spirit. They try to siphon your soul out of you. And some of them are successful. Many of them are successful. Even a short-term exposure to a narcissist starts to siphon your soul. You know you're dealing with a narcissist or a group of narcissists if you feel incredibly lonely in their presence. And you might be with them all the time and yet and still somehow you feel lonely. You might feel like they don't know you at all. They have a certain image of you in their mind that you know to be completely false and you would happily correct it, but they will never ever let you get the words out or the expression out to tell them who you really are. So you maybe have reached a point where you don't even bother to try to correct it and you might actually feel like you're living a double life but not really. It's a double life of the narcissist's creation. It's a double life that the narcissist keeps going because they won't ever allow the real you to come through. Because in many ways, they need this artificial you to remain the artificial them. Because if the artificial you starts to morph into the real you, it completely throws off the dynamic. And we all know that narcissists kind of live the same day over and over and over again. It's like, um, I think someone referenced Groundhog's Day, I think, where he kept living the same life over and over again, but his friend was able to like get him out of it or something like that. If my interpretation of it is true, narcissists are just like Groundhog's Day, except they never snap out of it. So they live the same day over and over and over again for the rest of their lives. And it's actually really sad for them, but it's also really destructive for the people around them because you're never ever able to move forward and you're never ever able to form those true connections. Hope you guys have been doing well. Thanks for listening to this video. I hope to get you another one either by the end of this week, which is tomorrow or this weekend, uh, but don't hold me to it. But I'm working on putting out some more content for you guys since I have left you without content for such a long time. Take care. And as always, I grant you the permission to exist. Bye-bye.